How's everyone doing today? It's good to hear. That's a lot of energy coming out of you guys. It, normally when I hit a group that's just had lunch, it's like, oh my god. It's the chocolate? Yes. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'll give you a little background on myself. The company is called Level 12, and actually, I started the company about six years ago with a friend of mine out of the U.S., and you know, a few years after that, we decided to go our own ways. And at that time, the company was Lead Canada. And I wanted to change things up. I wanted a new direction. I wanted a fresh approach to things, and I was looking for a new name. And I looked at, you know in life we have that imaginary scale, zero to 10? Zero was like comatose. 10, you're feeling excellence and unstoppable. We laugh, but the challenge is in today's business environment, in fact, the challenge in all environments is that 10 is no longer good enough. We need to be able to step it up. And I was thinking, you know, what, what sort of name, what sort of you know, branding would really represent that? And I came up with level 12. It means that, you know, 10 is no good enough, not good enough anymore. We have to go to a new level, it's called level 12. And level 12 is that level where most people do not think you can go. In fact, you know when you're at home, you have that quiet time and you look in the mirror and you doubt yourself, you're not sure you can go there. But that's the place I want to show people how to go to. Now, I have to get something out of the way because a lot of times when I come in to speak to people or I do a training with some of the companies I work with, people think I'm coming in to motivate them. I want you to know two things. Number one, I'm not into motivation. I truly not. Now that's not to say you're not going to be motivated. But this old aspect of let's rally the troops, rah, rah, rah. How many people have been to one of those sessions? You walk out the door and you go, what the hell was that all about? <laughs> and how's that help me today? Actually, if you really want to look at the science of motivation, there's a fantastic book out there right now, and it's called Drive by Daniel Pink. And what Daniel Pink does is look at the science of motivation. What really drives us as human beings? And really, that's my passion. I'm not coming in to be the, the motivational guy or the positive thinking guy. I'm not into positive thinking. I'm really not. The challenge is, you get the positive thinking guy who's running east looking for a sunset. He goes, I'm positive I'm going to find it. I'm positive I'm going to find it. You're never going to find it. It doesn't matter how positive you are. What I'm into really is resourceful thinking. That means you're really using your mind effectively in a powerful way. That means if you are running east looking for the, sun, the sunset, you get so far and you sit, take note of where you are and say, hold on, I'm not seeing a sunset. Where am I? Where is it I want to go? What's my objective? You turn around and look and go, that's the direction you want to go in. That's resourceful thinking. And that's what I want to promote to people. So let's be resourceful. And it, even there's a contrast when we look at the whole thinking process. You don't think positively, you feel positive. And there's, that's a razor's edge distinction to make. It's an emotion, it's not a thought process. You can think about love, but feeling love is a whole different game, isn't it? So it's great that you feel positive, and you'll, hopefully you'll feel positive today, but I want to think resourcefully. And what I love doing, what's been my passion over the last 25 years ago or, or so, is really looking at aspects of psychology and neurosciences. Discovering what our mind is all about, how it really operates, how it relates to our emotional system, and how both of those really impact everything we do. And, you know, I got my start, like I say, probably 25 years ago or so, where I had come out of college. I went to George Brown College, graduated, actually started my own business right away. And then you get into business, and are most people here like independent contractors, independent you got your own business? Okay, so have you ever heard of something you have to do within business called sales? So I, you know, we've got this great idea for a business. I get into business, I find out, oh, I've got to sell it. That's a new concept for me. And then within sales, there's something called, I don't know if you know about this, cold calling. Oh, yeah. Been there? 
Okay, so I can remember, and this is no word of a lie, sitting on a park bench, looking out like a strip mall of businesses, and thinking, you know what? I could actually start there, and then go to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I could actually start there, and go to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one. And then, without a word of a lie, three hours later, I got off that park bench and went home. And we laugh. But for me, it was a breakthrough. It was like, hold on a second, I gotta think about this. Why is it we do some of the things we do? Why don't we do some of the things we should do? We know how to do them. In fact, we know if we do them, it'll help us. And yet, we still don't do it. And that really began my journey. I want to find out why we do the things we do. What the thought process is, how our mind operates. How things like fear get in the way and hold us back. And I started going to seminars. And I started going to read books and videos, anything I could get my hands on. One of the first seminars I ever did back in 1989 was a Bob Proctor seminar. Anyone know Bob Proctor? I, for me, it was like surface level motivation. Rah, rah, rah. And I went to this weekend seminar and I came out of there and I was pretty excited. So that Monday morning I thought, cold calling, I'm going to go get him again. Again, I speak the truth to you today. I walk into the strip mall and I know exactly where it is. It's out by the airport. I think the Skyway Drive or something like that. Oh, this is this. First company I go into. I walk in the door, I'm motivated. I open the door, I walk in, there's a guy sitting on the phone. The only guy in there, he looks at me. He goes, F off and get the F out of my office. <laughs> Although he sort of expanded on that a little bit. I literally, I stood there shocked. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even turn around. I backed out of the office like this. <laughs> and it was like one of those little things where you, you come out of the office and you're like in this little three foot hallway and there's another door right there. And at that point, I changed my life. I asked a question. And the question was, who's got the problem? And I thought, it's him, not me. And I turned around and went right into the next door and went prospect. And I can tell you, 25 years later, I am one of the best cold callers out there. So for anyone who tells you cold calling's dead, that's because they suck at it. They're no good. I am good at it, I am elegant, I am professional, and I get through to high-level people. I remember a few years ago sitting in the office with the senior vice president of HR for Bell Canada. We're in the meeting 10 minutes. She goes, how did you get in here anyway? <laughs> so I'm, I'm very, very good at it today. But that, again, got me on this whole journey. I want to figure out how can we improve performance? How can we really take control of our mind? Have you ever heard the, the old expression that we only use 5% of our mind's potential? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you something. Neurosciences, just in the last five years, have discovered more about the mind than we've known in the last 5,000 years. And now we're realizing how true that statement really is. We've got the greatest computer in the world sitting right between our ears, and no one's ever given us an owner's manual. <laughs> and today, we're going to start opening up that owner's manual. And I've sent Lola a PDF of my workbook, and I just updated it like this week. Totally refreshed. I'm really, really excited about it. It's up to about 90 pages, so she can send it out to everybody here, and you can look at it. There's planning that you can do it. There's just tons of resources, and some of which we're going to talk today. So I got two questions to start things off. How many people here would love to improve the results you're getting? Show of hands. See, that's pretty much everyone. There's still some people sitting back going, you know, I'm pretty comfortable with the world I'm doing now. <laughs> How many people here would love to improve their results and do it with less stress? Oh yeah, a lot of hands going up. There's still people saying, you know what? I know the stress I get right now and something new would be real scary. So they want to stay with it. But that's what it's all about today. I want to give you some key resources that can help you really do better and have fun along the way. Now the way I do it is through a process of engaged learning. Okay, so I really like to engage my audience. So it's not just about, about you just sitting back and watching me for an hour. 
I want you to participate, whether it's vocally, if I ask you to raise your hand, raise your hand, get involved. Because what statistics show is this. If you just simply sit back and listen to me for the next hour, in 90 days, the retention factor is about 10% of what you hear. If you listen and take notes, the retention factor goes up to about 30 to 40%. And they show that if you listen, take notes, and actively participate, raise your hand, yell things back, your retention level goes up to about 90%. So there is a method to my madness. <laughs> I want you to get involved. Now, along the way, you know, well, I mentioned that you know I've worked with some great companies, uh, Nestle's and General Mills, and Hewlett Packard. This week I was working with Canadian Tire. Uh, in two weeks I worked with Home Depot. Some really great uh, people, and some people in sports and entertainment. I, you know, I graciously asked Lola if she could arrange my rearrange my time slot because I guess someone like me comes on at the end. Uh, but I was not able to do that today because I actually coached someone. I don't know if anyone's familiar with mixed martial arts in the UFC. I actually coach a UFC fighter and he's fighting tonight in Montreal. Um, so, and it's a real big deal for him. Uh, he's on the, on the main card. He, I don't know if you ever heard of George St. Pierre, but George St. Pierre is headline night. So it's, you know, it's one of those things where it could be a real elevator ride, where he actually got in touch with me because he fought on the first card in Toronto at the Rogers Center, where they had 55,000 people in. And this guy, Aside from everything else, it's just a really, really nice guy. Like you think these big bulking guys are getting to the stage and start fighting. He's a very, very nice, quiet, mild-mannered person. And the reason he got into mixed martial arts years ago, because he's not one of the big guys. He's what they call a lightweight. He's only 155 pounds. But when you're that small or smaller going through grade school and high school, you get picked on bullet. And he did. And he looked for a way out. And someone said, why don't you take you know, some martial arts to help protect yourself? So he did. And he became very, very good at it. His passion flowed through it. He ended up going down to Brazil and studying Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu down there. And he became one of the first Canadians to receive his black belt, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So this guy's just a really nice guy. But it was funny how the mind plays with him. Where he said, number one, he went into the fight at the Rogers Center and took his opponent for granted. His opponent was, it was his first fight in the UFC. So he thought, oh, I've been in the UFC for a few fights, I'm pretty good, you know, I'm trained, I'll do my thing. But he took it for granted. And it was funny too, he said, you know, imagine 55,000 people, he's walking out, and it was like one voice he heard going, you're gonna lose! And he said, just played with his head. Now he's walking in, doubting himself. He ended up losing that fight. The guy he lost to is now a world champion. And it was like an elevator ride, where the guy, one guy went up, and Mark went and The next fight, he was fighting for his life to stay in. So, you know, we've been working for the last year. He's won his last two fights, and he's worked he's for three in a row tonight. So, thank you for re-raising. I, I like to be available for him, so if he wants to call and chat before he's going. So I appreciate your support on that. So, just working with some great people, and one of the things I've learned along the way, in working with fantastic people, and you're that same type of people here. It's an opportunity for you to learn, but it's also an opportunity for me to learn. And one of the things I've learned in working with some fantastic people from great companies is that the very, very, very best people who create outstanding success, they're not looking for me to come in here and just like throw up in the, the clouds and let the angels come down and so they're singing hallelujah so you see this monumental shift in your life. Those people who create such outstanding success really are looking for small distinctions, little things. They understand because actually the better you get, the harder it is to improve. If you get someone who's just a loser, not doing well, you can give them a whole bag of tricks to be better. But when you start performing at a really high level, it's the small things you're looking for. And you understand that if I can just take that one little thing and I work on it day after day after day, it gets bigger and you get better. Consider this, consider a plane that's taking off from Toronto going to Vancouver. As the plane takes off, 
you're sitting in your seat. If it's off course, just by 1%, would you notice that, yes or no? No, you're not gonna notice that. What if the plane is off course 1% 10 minutes later? Are you gonna notice that? I ain't not gonna notice that. But what if that pattern repeats itself for say four or five hours? Do you land in Vancouver, yes or no? No, now, where do you land? That could be like anywhere. But here's the thing, for business, it could be crashing in the ocean. You're out of business because you kept doing little things wrong day after day after day. So we want to look at the small things that I'm going to throw at you today and I'm going to throw a ton and take them all in and know that you can take any one of them and start working on it and you'll see that steady improvement over time. How many people in the room by show of hands have ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Dr. Edward Dem? Okay, the rest of you, have you heard of Google? Okay. Homework tonight. You're going to go and Google Dr. Edward Deming. See, after World War II, the U.S. military was in Japan trying to help rebuild. They were a destroyed country. D-E-M-I-N-G. M like Michael. Dr. Edward Deming. So, the U.S. military is in Japan trying to help rebuild Japan after World War II. General MacArthur is just so infuriated, he can't even make a phone call. So he says, this is it, things have to change, you have to change now. He went to the leaders of Japan and he said, I'm going to bring in someone to help work with your business leaders to help rebuild this country. His name, Dr. Edward Deming. He's a quality expert. And he brought Deming in to work with the people in Japan, the business leaders. And he had one premise. He said, focus on improving small things every single day. And he said, get your people to focus on improving small things every single day. He says, don't worry about the big things, the big things will follow. But he said, if you do that, in five years, you will flood the world with quality products. He said, if you continue to do that, you will become a world-dominant economic power in 10 to 12 years. He was right on both accounts. Today in Japan, the Deming Award is still one of the most prestigious awards given to business for all. He's revered as a god. If you go into the head office of Sony Corporation, there's two pictures, one of Deming, one of the founder. Who do you think is bigger? So it's all about the small things that we want to focus on, and don't let any of them go by you. Grab them, reach them, you know, write it down. Now, I also know that coming to a conference like this, especially on a beautiful day like this, my God, the down, you don't really it. It's beautiful out. <laughs> and you're stuck in here. But here, here's the thing. You know, often when I'm talking to people in business and they're, you know, they're going to an offsite meeting and you're coming to a conference, people are going, oh my God, I'm going to spend all day there. And while I'm not in the office, my email's piling up, my voicemails are piling up, I'm missing this beautiful day in Toronto and tomorrow's probably going to rain. So, let me tell you why you want to be here by the way of a little story. And it's a story of a lumberjack competition. And it pitted the very best lumberjacks in Canada against the very best lumberjacks in the U.S. Any Americans in the room? <laughs> they, they hate this story. <laughs> so the whole objective behind this competition is to see who can cut the most wood from the point the sun comes up in the morning until the time the sun sets in the afternoon. So, the combatants come in. U.S. guys, Americans sitting over there with his saw, Canadian guys sitting over there with his saw, the judge is in the middle and says, you ready? Saw's ready, sun breaks the plane, go! And they're cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting. They're going cutting, 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 going fast, hard, they're going at it. And then about an hour into the competition, the American looks over and he sees the Canadian stopping and going inside his tent. The American thinks, what a fool, there's no time for breaks. What does the American do? He works even? Harder, going at it, going at it. And then a few minutes later, the Canadian comes back out and resumes. They're going hard at it, and then about an hour later, there's the American looking over at the Canadian stopping again. Going inside his tent, he thinks, what is it, is he crazy? He's not, you he can't be stopping, you can't be resting, you gotta go, 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 go. So this pattern repeats itself all day long. And then all of a sudden the sun sets, the judge calls halts the competition. 
They put down their saws. The Americans walked around very proudly, knowing he didn't take any rest, didn't take a single break all day. He went at it, went at it, went at it. <laughs> and then the judge measures over here, and then the judge measures over here. He says, we have a clear winner. The American walks up very proudly, and the judge says, it's the Canadian. And the, the American says, come on, what's going on here? You're ripping me off. I was looking over at him, seeing a break, taking a rest every hour. The Canadian jumps up, and he says, whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Time out of here. I wasn't taking a rest, and I wasn't taking a break. I was sharpening my saw. <laughs> That's what these conferences are about. It's about you coming and getting new strategies, new tools to bring back to your business so you can do it better. Not just do it different. Different isn't any good if it's not better. We've got to improve what we're doing. And I can tell you too, when I look at the economies around the world, there's a whole lot of bad going on. But right here in this country, we're not perfect, but things are pretty good. So it's time for us to get stronger. It's time for us to get stronger physically, mentally, and emotionally. And then we can take on the world and really thrive. So if you guys are really into helping me help you achieve that sort of objective, Stand up for a second and join me in five breaths. Okay? Everyone up. Oh, you're going off, but I just ate lunch. <laughs> you need to join me in five agreements. And the first agreement is, if you really want to take your business, your life to the next level, now, let me just jump in there for one second. When I talk to people, even in business, I don't go in just to say, I want to show you how you can be better in your business. I was working with Canadian Tire this week. I didn't sit there and say, I want to help you be a better employee for Canadian Tire. I want to help you be a stronger person. When you become a stronger person, that permeates through all of your life. So, the first thing I'm asking you to do is you've got to be willing to stretch. Okay, and I don't mean just stretch your body. I mean, you've got to be willing to stretch your comfort zone. You see, there's two laws of human nature. The first law is we all gravitate to and want to stay within our comfort zone. The second law of human nature is that in order for us to grow, for us to get better, we have to go where? Outside our comfort zone. In what I do, I can elegantly take you to the edge but I can't bring you over. That step has to be taken by you. So today, I need you to stretch. Think of these walls as being your comfort zone. You know people in here, you're comfortable. How many people would be willing to walk out in the hallway and just put their hand out to a perfect stranger and say, hey, how's it going? Yeah, you're saying, yeah, I would. Oh, come on, let's go. I'll <laughs> take you out of there. But I need you guys to stretch. So this is what I, I, I want to hear you. I want to hear you loud and resound. If you're willing to stretch your comfort zone just for the day, maybe the week or the rest of the month of your life, say yes! Yes! yes. Okay, let's hear the scale of zero to ten. Where was that? Five. Yeah. That's like that lunchtime, you think I did it good enough? <laughs> or some people not doing it all saying, you yell louder and sound like I'm part of it. <laughs> this is where you need to step up to level 12, okay? So let's hear it at level 12. So as people are walking by, they're going, what the hell's going on in there? So I need to hear you. Level 12, if you're willing to stretch your comfort zone, say yes! Yes! Perfect. That was actually quite impressive. And that rolls us right into the next agreement. And the next agreement is, you've got to be willing to play full out. Now, anytime I'm in with an adult group and I say, you've got to be willing to play full out, what are adults concerned with? What's that? What yeah, exactly. How am I going to perceive? What are you going to think about me? And adults always want to shrink back. They don't want to play full out. But there's a segment of our population, and they don't care what other people think. Who are they? Kids. Kids don't care what other people think. Kid walks into a living room, sees a towel, picks up a towel, wraps it around their neck, goes, I'm Superman. <laughs> when was the last time you were going for a coffee, uh, sitting down the hallway, going, anyone want one cream and sugar? Now you're going, oh, what would they think? 
But I want to explore something with you. Here's something really interesting in terms of statistics. When we look at the whole learning process, let me see my notes, here we go. When do we do most of our major learning? When we're young, our mind's wide open. By year one, we've learned to walk. Imagine the average adult. He couldn't walk. He'd be trying, 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 dad, ah, on this. Kids just keep going, they keep going, they keep going, they keep going. And what do we do with the kids? We what? We cheer them on. Oh, you're doing a great job, you're doing a great job. We give them that emotional support. That's year one. By year two, they begin to communicate in language. By year five, this is actually an interesting and somewhat scary stat. They know 90% of the words regularly used by adults. It's like we just stop learning, we start taking more on. <coughs> By the sixth year, they've learned to read. At ages six and seven, the mind is a veritable sponge. They just take information in. You know, we put our kids into the French Catholic school system when they were going into junior kindergarten. Stone cold English. But because my wife's from Quebec, we had the options, so we put them in. And it was so funny. With my daughter, we went to like the first parent-teacher interview, and we're sitting there, and she goes, you know, she's very quiet. She doesn't say much at all. Both of us are thinking, she doesn't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> but the mind is a sponge. She just looks at the other kids, and they're in the same situation. She takes it all in, and within a few months, she's speaking French. They don't introduce English the way four. And she just takes it in, and speaking, both my kids are bilingual, fully bilingual. Unbelievable. You know, as a child, the mind is completely open. We're born creative, and it's like we educated out of them. So we want to be more like kids. That's when we absorb, that's when we take it in. Think about a child walking down the street. A child comes upon a puddle. What does a child do? Jump. Jump. Jumps right in. Boom! <laughs> Splash! Wants to experience this. Full immersion. That's how we learn. <laughs> Now, after this immersion experience, the child may say, huh? the feeling of wet underwear, not so good. <laughs> an adult, same situation. Adults walking down the street, comes upon a puddle, what does an adult do? <laughs> they don't just walk around, they moan and complain as they go. I can't believe it, the tax I paid in the city, there's a puddle like that, what happened to Mayor Ford? He was going to fix all our problems. <laughs> but we have to moan and complain as we go. I need you guys to be like kids. Playful out. I also, when I say playful out, that also means you have to give everything you do, everything you've got. Everything. And that makes some people tired just listening to it. <laughs> but that's why I say we have to build strength, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Some people are standing right now going, oh, can I sit down? I'm tired already. <laughs> That should be a warning signal to you. <laughs> I, I do all day training. I'm on my feet literally from like 8 till 4 or something like that. And I get people standing for 10 minutes going, oh, 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 Come on. That's a sign. Wake up. So I need you guys to play full out. Are you guys willing to play full out? Say yes! Yeah. No. That's not bad, but it dipped a little bit. It did, didn't it? And see, that's the thing. Like, I can pump you up and get you going, but you guys got to hold yourself to that standard. I need you guys to hold yourself there. Level 12 all day long. That's our standard today. So if you guys are willing to play full out, say yes! Yes! Oh, fantastic. That was good. We also need you to play fair. And in business today, when I say play fair, that means that we need people and business leaders with integrity to be an example to others. We want to support the people around us. Play fair. Remember the days of Enron and WorldCom? Those leaders who sort of ventured into the gray area. And even people that weren't directly involved with it but sort of knew something about it, didn't say anything about it because they were worried about it. Come on, stand by your values. Stand by what you believe. Play fair in life. That's what we need. When you're communicating with a potential client, they need someone with integrity. 
If you say you're going to do your job by a certain time, you're going to deliver. The other thing is to play safe. There's one thing for me to say, stretch, play full out. But we're all different people, aren't we? We all, when I talk about comfort zones, if there's 100 people in the room, that means we've got 100 different comfort zones, and we've got to respect all those. So sometimes I ask for a volunteer, and someone goes, whoa, I'm in. Someone else may be like this. You don't go along and say, come on, get the hand up. And I was like, there, for them, that's a huge stretch. So we, you know, we want to play fair, we want to play safe. What I love about my learning, too, the way I do it, fifth agreement, I want to have fun. I want to have fun when we learn. That's when we learn best. You know when you're having fun when you learn? The learning goes in deeper. You retain it longer. It's easier to recall. So there is a method to my madness. You're playing with your mind. So we've got five agreements to stretch, to play full out, play fair, play safe, and have fun. So level 12, if you're in for all five agreements, just for the day, possibly the week or the rest of your life, say yes! Yes! Yeah. Yeah, you ready for your first test? Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the room's going, oh, what the hell's going on with that? There was no test here. <laughs> okay, so here's what I want you to do. See if you can create a little bit of space around you. Let's try and utilize some of the space around here. Just create a little space. Here's what I'm going to want you to do. Is just do like this minor movement like this. See if you've got enough room just to do this minor like that. Just a little jump back and forth and see if you got a bit of room side to side. Have you got that? If you don't get, have that, just create it for yourself. Now, what, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> I love playing with your mind. I want to show you just how quickly I can mess you up completely. I'm just going to ask you to do a simple task. I want you to just listen to me. Say this. Jump in. Jump out. Jump out. Jump in. Jump in. Jump out. Jump out. Jump left. Jump left. Jump right. Jump right. Was that simple enough? Yes. Good. Let's go to the next level. <laughs> now, as you say it, I want you to do it. Okay, so just watch me for a second. So if I say jump out, you just do jump out. But say it. So jump in. Jump out. No, whatever works. Okay, so good. Ready? So here we go. Jump in. Jump in. Jump out. Jump out. Jump left. Jump left. Jump right. Jump right. Not bad. We're going in pretty good rhythm. There you go. You're doing really well. Let's try it one more time just to make sure you got it. Jump in. Jump in. Jump out. Jump out. Jump left. Jump left. Jump right. Jump right. You guys are good. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. This time, I want you to do what I say, but say the opposite. Okay, so it'd be like this. If jump in is going forward, you're going to say, yeah, jump in. So if, if you're going to go jump right, that's it. You got it? Everyone good with that? So this is, again, do what I say, but say the opposite. So jump in. Jump out. Not too much rhythm there. Jump out. Jump in. Jump left. Jump right. It was so funny. I see people going in opposite direction. <laughs> Jump right. Jump left. Jump right. Jump out. Jump in. <laughs> so this time, say what I say, but do the opposite. So if I say jump right, you'll say jump right, but you will jump left. Okay, so jump left. Jump left. I love these people that do. Jump right. Jump right. Jump in. Jump right. Jump out. Jump right. I think people are about to fall right over. But what are we really doing here? We're giving your mind mixed messages. And you're like, like literally, you can see people just like, oh my gosh. I mean, unless you've been to the bar at lunchtime or something. 
But that's what happens when we give our mind mixed messages. So we, let's, let's recalibrate. Do what I say, say what I say, do, let's get your mind back in order. <laughs> Jump in. Jump, Jump in. in. Jump back. Jump back. Jump left. Jump left. Jump right. Jump right. Oh, you guys are so good. Give yourself a hand. You guys, oh my gosh. But you see how quickly we can just mess with our mind? Now what happens in our daily life? Especially with kids. Is it possible we can give our kids mixed messages? That's where we need to become congruent in what we do and what we say. And that's also a powerful sales technique, isn't it? I mean, when your, your words, your tonality, your physiology come together to send one message, the client buys it. But is it possible to have to send mixed messages? Do uh, you think we can get that for Friday? Friday. Friday. Uh, yeah, we can get it to you. <laughs> Now, we're not going to always be as blatant as that, but is it possible that's what we're doing as well? So, you know, it's not only a matter of working with our mind, we want to make sure that we're working with someone else's mind. So what I'm going to do now is give you six principles for living at level 12. And when you get the workbook, it's all in there. But if you want to take some notes now, you can do that as well. So six principles for living at level 12. The first principle is you must take responsibility. We have a real problem in today's society with taking responsibility. You need to own it. You need to be the owner of your change. And I don't care what is going on around you. I don't care how tragic situations may be. You're responsible for three things at all times. How you think, how you feel, and how you act or react to a situation. You look at New Jersey and New York right now, where lives have been devastated. You could have two people standing side by side where houses were side by side, and one saying, life is over, and the other is saying, we're alive, we'll rebuild. You know, there's a story uh, that happened back in 1980 where a 13-year-old girl, Carrie Lightner, was walking down a California road and hit and dragged to death by a drunk driver. It wasn't the first time he had been charged with their driving. Can you imagine being the mother who gets that call? Devastating. And for some people, life as you know it is just like, it's over, I can't live anymore. It wasn't for her. Candy Lightyear looked at this completely differently. She said, I'm going to bring meaning to this. I'm going to do something about this. What organization do you think she started? Yeah. Uh, Matt. We have challenging situations, I know. But it's what you decide to think about, how you decide to feel, how you decide to act in a situation. Take responsibility. 